and I am from South Africa. I contribute in the uh, Siswati Wikipedia, and I don't stress about contributing there, actually. But I am, and another guy from the United States, but who's originally from uh, uh, Swaziland, who are very much active in that Wikipedia currently. So, um, we want to talk about a subject called uh, the quotation of oral sources, uh, oral sources in a decolonized context. Um, as we all know, that this conference is based on this um, um, a subject of uh, decolonizing the, con the, the, the internet. So, uh, we also wanted to have our say. And our say started when we went through a lot of reading and we also went through a lot of research to look at what is it that we can, that are the people saying uh, regarding this subject of the quotation of, um, of oral, sources, uh, oral sources in a decolonized con content. I'm sorry, I, I am dyslectic. I just find out like um, uh, uh, two, two months ago about that. So my reading is, <laughs> anyway. Yes, so we're gonna be talking about that now. And um, do you wanna continue? And um, I was searching for it in Wikipedia, and I didn't, I, I couldn't find it. So I started being passionately irritated by that problem, and um, I had a conversation with Bobby, and we said, okay, we would like to talk about that topic today. Um, we don't have solutions, but we would like to make you think about certain topics and certain questions. Yeah, so as I've mentioned earlier on that this is a subject that has been researched a lot about uh, uh, scholars, they have actually tried to find the connection between um, oral knowledge and written knowledge. And then to me especially, it touches me directly because I am from a lineage of family that is very much oral orientated. My grandmother, for an example, um, is the one who chose the second and the third wife for my grandfather. And I asked my mom, would you do that to my father and then choose the second and the third wife for my father? She said, never, I'm never gonna do that, you know? And it told me that something is dying there because according to our culture from my mom's side, uh, the, the, the first wife is the one that is supposed to choose the second and the third wife to look after the cattle, the other one will look after the cattle, the other one will look after the land, and the other one will look after the kids. So it's a matril matrilineal structure in, my, ma in my, my mother's side of the family. And in my father's side of the family, something all, uh, different. But um, <clears throat> one other thing is that my grandmother again, Whenever there is a funeral or whenever there is a wedding, what happens is she will tell you that, okay, fine, um, we, we want to organize food for the people. And then you ask her, how, are you, how do you know that there's going to be, uh, how many people are going to be attend attending? She says, no, just, just invite everyone else. But there's one amazing thing that's going to happen there. She is going to be able to feed everyone else without even knowing how many people are coming to the event. And you ask yourself, how do you know that? She's like, no, I just know. She's going to tell you it's going to rain. How do you know it's going to rain? She's, she's still alive. She's going to tell you it's going to rain. How do you know it's going to rain? No, I just know that it's going to rain. 
because the gods, and then she's saying, the gods told me that it's going to rain. We know because we've been living here and we know that when, uh, during the, the time of September, um, uh, the gods, uh, it was this time when the gods, because in our, in, our, in our culture, we don't have 12 months. We have 13 months, 13 months. So he's telling you, because uh, in this month, it's named after a certain god that provides rain for us. So they are happy this year, and it's going to rain. And when uh, you are looking at what, at the weather pattern using your education, but you cannot, you want proof, something that is tangible. But for her, she does not open, and eventually it rains. And then you ask yourself, how does she know? She's not educated, she does not even know how to write a name. You know, so it forms part of a very close um, a relationship with me because of that reason. And I had to then go to look at the many research that has happened over, the, over, over time by scholars, uh, by, by, by people on the open movement, by everyone else, to see how is it, what is it, what are the least, what solutions did they have in order to bridge the two? What is it that I can do? Then that's when we started this conversation. And the solutions are right here. <laughs> These are the solutions right here. Yes. Do you want to talk on that? Yes, <laughs> exactly. We don't know what the solution is. What we would like to reflect about with you, and these are the examples that Bobby were giving, um, is that there is a big difference between oral knowledge and written knowledge. And it's two different information systems. It's completely two different cultures. And sometimes they are not they're incompatible, they're, you can't combine them. So that's one of the big problems. We don't have a solution yet, but um, we also are talking a lot about so-called indigenous knowledge. And we were asking ourselves, what is this? Isn't knowledge knowledge? And don't we have a global knowledge? Why do we have to talk about Western knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and different knowledges. And isn't that maybe a Eurocentric and evolu evolutionistic approach and idea that societies have to develop from the primitive to a higher level? So what we would like you to do is to question also your wording when you're talking about knowledge or indigenous knowledge about so-called developed countries and underdeveloped countries? Um, at this stage of our presentation, we want to throw the question to you then, to tell us the difference or what is it that you think exists between indigenous knowledge and the knowledge that is accepted. Anyone that can tell me what is indigenous knowledge and what is, I don't know whether to call it Western knowledge or what. But what do you understand about indigenous knowledge? Anyone can tell me? <laughs> what is indigenous knowledge? Yes, Nozibele. Um, hello again. I think I'll, I'll just say it's all about culture to me. I'll make an example of one of the articles that I have translated about marriage. And while I was translating, I said, uh -uh, man. in my culture, this is not marriage, so we have to differentiate. So I have to go to Professor Nima, uh, he's working, one of my colleagues, he's a specialist in the indigenous knowledge system, is that what is the manner in which marriage is described in another culture might be di different in the other culture. So I decided to, 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 to start a new, to write a, a new uh, a, a article which will say indigenous South African marriage and then translate that. Then if you can look at it, you will see the difference. Because in our case, marriage is not only about you and me, 
In fact, you started a very big relationship between the glands, your glands, and my glands. So it's a long, long process. So I would just say it's about culture. Yes. It's about culture. Someone else want to weigh in here? At the back there. I hope you didn't Google there. <laughs> I think knowledge, and, and specifically indigenous knowledge, is something which is about the indigenous perspectivism, and um, about that this perspectivism uh, could contradict to uh, the hierarchy of a Western or global Northern knowledge, and uh, knowledge which should be accepted as it is, and not uh, should be not categorized into Western categories. Like one short example. Um, anthropophagy, so eating humans, or in Western culture, re referred to as cannibalism. Um, and if you look to specific cultures, which, when you look from the Western side, people eating people, but when what they they think about when they're eating people, that they're no different to animals. And if they're eating animals, they have to get out the human out of the animal in order to make it eatable. So they have totally different categories than we do have, animal, nature, and so on. So this should be respected, looking at these indigenous knowledge sources, that they are sources, one of their own, and they should not be compared or put into hierarchy. I love Thank that you. one, actually. <laughs> um, yes, over there. Thank you. I love this question because it's a seemingly straightforward question, but once you start looking and uh, start unpacking it, you, you find layers of issues uh, that you that you have to deal with it. So I, w I would also, in order to answer it, I would also like to turn it around and point out that one of the issues is that we make the assumption that there is a single corpus that we can put fit stuff into, and what uh, and and these are the, and because of this assumption, we keep running into these challenges. So maybe what if we start from the other end with the assumption that there are many parallel worlds, many parallel cultures, and it's not about putting them into one box, but finding ways of allowing them to coexist and to interlink. And to interlink. Thank you. Okay, indigenous language sources, I think there's three things that come to mind. The issue of power, exploitation, and disappearance. And I think that the issue of power is something we must acknowledge as middle class, Western educated people, that we can go to an, uh, a woman in the village, a storyteller, get her stories, I can go there and I can then get published and then I hold the copyright over that work. So we've got a great power to exploit. And so how do we work in bringing the knowledge and wisdom, indigenous knowledge and wisdom, uh, to make it widely available without exploiting the, source, the sources? The fact that they are disappearing as well, the fact that governments don't invest. We've long talked in Africa about indigenous knowledge systems, but actually we haven't put our money where our mouth is. And I think the, the contribution from the uh, Namibian uh, comrade there earlier on uh, about the, the long history of exploitation and, and, and that we may not be meaning, we may be well-meaning everyone in this room and I think uh, Wikipedians are the most well-meaning people I've come across, but we still have the power to exploit. So we need to be sensitive to that power and look for different ways of working with this. Thank you, um, Thank <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so the, the question that we're asking ourselves is how an equal exchange between the oral and the written can be made and how to build a bridge between oral embossed and written dominated knowledge systems. And um, I also attended the Decolonize the Internet conference the last two days. And another topic that we would like to talk about is the question of criteria and criteria of relevance and notability. Uh, before we engage in this one, 
There was <laughs> sorry. There was Bobby. there was a point that you mentioned there at the back that it cut about categorization, you know. Because once you take the indigenous knowledge, then you want to categorize it according to your Western knowledge, then it changes everything. Why do you have to do that? Then I come back to Messi Sulu's uh, 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 response. <laughs> okay. <Sorry>. Yeah, so <laughs> what, what we are aiming to do now is, is to is to, is to make, make us think. I don't want to say make you, because it's something that we are still trying to figure out ourselves, to say what is, what is happening. You know, we, we, we acknowledge, all of us in the room, I guess, now, as we're standing here, that there are differences between the two knowledges. There are differences between Indigenous, indigenous knowledge and let's call it the Western knowledge, the general knowledge that is written that you go to Wikipedia and read about. And we also acknowledge that it needs to be documented somehow. But in the documentation process, there is power, as she mentioned, you know, that I would go and want to extract that indigenous knowledge, but I would hold the rights to to, 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 to the work that has been done. And while the person that is actually owning the work is not, is not uh, a owner of that work. So, yeah, we can continue to the next slide. During the conference, Decolonize the Internet, I was surprised how, surprised how much frustration there was about articles having been deleted having been written and written and rewritten and then having been deleted. And we were starting intensively to think about the criteria of relevance and notability. Um, and the question linked to these two is, do we maybe need a discussion about policies? The internet, yesterday we were talking about, um, at the decolonization of the uh, internet conference, we were talking about um, setting one of the things that hampers the growth of small language Wikipedias, it is because of the policies that are there. And it's one of the things that uh, people wanted to, to change. Am I right? What is the truth? <laughs> In, in my personal uh, opinion, at least, in smaller languages or uh, smaller Wikipedias, it is easier to have a discussion around which norms should govern that, and they should not all uh, be required to copy the English, the French, or the top ten languages. Yes. And so they can look into their own norms and what makes sense within that culture or the language of that particular wiki. I, in, uh, uh, in South America, in the Aymara language, for instance, I don't think that the, the requirement of sources, written sources, makes as much sense as it would make in the Spanish language. Yes. And we, just, just as, a, as a caveat, we, we, we just created these slides like this so that anyone can come in whenever they want to come in be free. We, we don't ex uh, consider ourselves uh, expect. A small comment. Yeah. Um, for uh, sourcing and no notability, way back when we were writing uh, French Wikipedia, I'm French, um, in 2008 we just had 50,000 uh, articles uh, when I landed on Wikipedia. We didn't have uh, the, the we, we were not putting source on every sentence. We were not putting source on articles or some people did it and some people didn't. We had good articles which were four, a, uh, four page of text, well written, with no source, source at, at all. We didn't care that just after when we had some controversy in the media that we started to add the, the requirement, requirement of sourcing every fact. But at the beginning and up to 50,000 articles, we didn't have such rules for our Wikipedia. So I don't see why 
the small uh, Wikipedia with 500 or 10,000 should be sourcing all, all facts and um, uh, deleting articles if they don't have source? No, no. We, we were much more uh, careless ourselves, so um, the small Wikipedia should take it easy on this side. I might be drawing back to, uh, but, but forgive me for whatever reason. There's a problem here. I, I experienced this problem several times. Knowledge, the information that I get about the things, the way we do things, the way things have been done long ago in the closer culture and Amambondo, that information you can get it if you go to the elderly people in the village. We still have the one who was born in 1914. And really he can still tell you, remember, how did you do this culture? What is a, a polygamy, a makolo, when you ask him? He will tell you, how did they practice all those things? in their own way. It's a very interesting information and it, 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 it's, it's very positive. It can build us if we can go back to those roots. You take this information, you record this uh, uh, grandmother and then you go and transcribe as it is to develop a monolingual corpus. That's what we do as well. And then you write on Wikipedia. So somebody else so sees your article. She said, no man, that's rubbish. I think that's what she said. And then she delete everything. And then she re rewrite it. And then she will put the references, list of references, according to research. And it means those people who conducted this research, they are more important than the person who practiced the culture itself. So it's very, very, very difficult. I think we should address that. I don't, I don't say allow anybody, it's also wrong just to go there and write and write and write. I might write rubbish even myself. Or I might lie, you see, for whatever reason. We need sources, sources are important, but let us not be choosy in terms of sources. That grandmother is very important. We depend on her. We go to her when things are wrong and she will tell us, no, this is not a closer culture. This one is lying, you see. So we need a, 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 a very good guidance on that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, let's go to the back and then go together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, we have the problem that unfortunately our time is up. Um, I don't know if someone is going to come to pull us out uh, from the stage, otherwise we go on. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, we'll give... Uh Sorry? Okay, we can go on. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, I will just stay in for five minutes and then after that we move out. Um, there's a very pertinent... <laughs> Okay, so there's this thing called feedback Hi. <laughs> next to the speakers. <laughs> Usually Hi. it does. Okay, one, two, three. Uh, okay, it looks okay. So, uh, I'd like first to uh, support uh, whoever something said there in the front about the French Wikipedia. The reason that the Wikipedias in large languages want a lot of sources is that they are so large with so many different people writing. And these are huge communities. Uh, they went beyond being communities. They are societies. Mm -hmm. Lots of people there don't know each other. There are so many of them. So when somebody else writes something, it's likely that you don't actually know this person and you don't trust them. So you need a third party verification in these very large communities. In smaller communities, 
sources are probably less important. So um, the demand for sources is not the thing that um, gets in the way of developing Wikipedias in small languages because they don't really exist. Uh, the demands for sources developed in each of the large languages separately in English and French and German and so on. Uh, they don't really apply to the Wikipedias in small languages until they actually develop inside them. So that's not the thing that uh, gets in the way. The thing that gets in the way, as far as I see it, the thing that gets in the way of developing um, Wikipedias in smaller languages is the fact that the people who would be, m most of the people who would be most capable to write in the Wikipedias in small languages uh, usually tend to also know another large language, such as English or French. So when they need some information that they would find in Wikipedia, they would probably find it in English or French. They wouldn't even notice that the information is missing in their language. Uh, that's a highly problematic paradox. Somebody called it uh, uh, the, the disease of knowledge. You, you already know something, so you don't even notice that somebody else who doesn't know it doesn't know it. Uh, so it really depends on people like you. Uh, you know a small language and you know uh, small small by the presence on the internet. Not it, it's Your language is spoken by millions of people. It's not that small. But um, you know this and uh, you can write in your language. Um, and it's good that you are aware of this and uh, you should just encourage your friends to do it more. And this Demands for sources, that's a problem in the Wikipedias and big languages. It's not a problem in your language. I am glad that we all recognize that there is a problem. Um, I want to move quite quickly. The point is, we all recognize that there is disparity between oral knowledge and oral citation and the, the, the standard way of our knowledge. That we, I don't know what, what to call that knowledge. The knowledge that you know. Is it the Western knowledge? It's not the Western knowledge. Well, can it's I? It's just knowledge, right? Because it's acceptable. Anyway, yes. It recorded. Uh, no. I published I knowledge. Ah, anyway. Can I comment? Yes. Uh, what, what is small? How small is small? Uh, <laughs> Finnish language Wikipedia has more than 400,000 articles, and the Finnish language speakers are 6 million. Yoruba language Wikipedia is some, some thousand articles. It is spoken by 30 million people. What is more? I, I suggest we, we speak about oral, oral mediation or oral cultures and literate cultures. Could be, could it, would, it's not about small or big. It's about literate culture background and oral culture. We do, however, agree, whatever it is, whether it's we say, we're seeing it as small, we're seeing it as big, we're seeing it as the number of people are contributing there are, 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 are small, or I, I, I didn't get your second point, but we do agree that it needs to be documented, right? Somehow we need to docu document that. You do agree with that, okay. I, yeah. I think this notion of small Wikipedias is a very imperialistic uh, notion. It's more or less like looking down on the small Wikipedias. Uh, oh yeah, you can be careless. Okay, I mean, you know, uh, everything's okay. It's, uh, I think that's a very bad way of thinking. As you just mentioned, what happens when uh, either that uh, small Wikipedia gets larger or what is the perspective in, in, in uh, relative size? So we should get back in a discussion on how uh, are we going to, you know, accept this oral tradition. Yes. That is the important issue. It's not that, okay, you, 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 you have your little playground, you still go on, you know. That's not what we should be discussing about. <laughs> Very true. Um, I'm going to have to I, close. Yeah. Please make your last piece and then we close. <laughs> I have, yeah. I, I wonder. Is, is it correct to think about it as a problem rather than as an opportunity? I mean, it, this is the occasion when you can document whatever was so far just oral knowledge and you can start interviewing the other people, whoever is the people who has the knowledge and which is recognized by the community of the speaker of that language 
as the people who is, uh, let's say, traditionally, and, and, I don't know, I'm not familiar with, but I think from what I heard before that uh, there are uh, people who are recognized as uh, uh, the owner uh, of the knowledge, and you can interview them, you yeah, can take a experience. movie, and you can document, and you create the basis of having the sources, the former sources, and then you think as a second step to put them in Wikipedia. Um, the, Thank you. Um, Peter Collette has actually done that. I was part of that project, and we have actually have done it exactly like that. But there is a problem there that I wanted to highlight uh, um, quickly. But anyway, so, yeah. the previous speaker has just made the point I'm about to try and, and nail down a little bit harder. The difference between documentation and recording. We have technology to record in non-documentary form that is just as valid as evidence. Oral traditions should be recorded as words that are spoken. People that are seen in video format, in um, spoken word recordings, not documented on paper and as, as digits that become, or as, as, as bits that become letters of words. That is a, difference, a different way of recording and it's perfectly valid. If you've got that record, the other thing about not um, bothering to record it, uh, citations now, that has a problem in the future when new people come in and see this stuff and they say, where did this come from? We yes. don't know these people, they're not here anymore. If you have got it recorded in some form, you've got your evidence. For oral recordings, use for, for, for oral um, knowledge, use oral recordings. It's, to me, the obvious way. The, the point of this presentation, the point of this presentation is actually what Peter has highlighted right now. We wanna, we wanna bring to ourselves or to, to, the, to, to, to you as the audience and ourselves as, as editors of Wikipedia to say, does really um, oral knowledge belong to Wikipedia per se? I don't believe that it, believes on, it belongs on Wikipedia per se. I don't believe that when my grandmother tells me about you know, um, the rain, that it's gonna rain, but she does not know how to explain how she knows that. And I need to capture it in, in written knowledge. It's equal as when she is telling me orally. I don't believe that when um, my surname, in our culture we have, um, the way we have been documenting, I don't wanna use the word document, the way we have been, yes, documenting, um, our, our history is through songs, praise poetry. So everyone with my surname will have some praise poetry that is the same with everyone else that is having my surname. So I don't believe that whenever you do that, you need to document it down somehow. There is a death, you have to wear somehow uh, differently you have to have a particular dance when you are uh, um, 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 uh, doing a, a particular citation or doing a particular praise um, uh, poetry or something like that. Um, that you cannot turn it into words that are written down. It cannot be as equal as when that person is actually performing that. So perhaps Wikipedia is not right, the right place to record oral knowledge. Exactly. That's our argument standing here. And it's the end of our presentation without going to the other slides. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so we can Have go to lunch. Have a good lunch break. Sure. <laughs>